Good morning again. It's Monday, 6-11, and here we are in the Word. We're asking the Lord to give us our daily bread. We hope you had a good weekend. Obviously, if you've looked out today into the streets and into your yard, uh, at least where we are, we're getting a pretty good amount of snow. Uh, thankfully, it doesn't look like it's going to be as bad as they predicted. So higher elevations are getting much more. We'll get a couple of inches on the ground. The streets are just wet and... Um, it's just part of being in Vermont, right? When I lived up north, we weren't, we didn't even put seeds into the ground until after May seventh, I think, the first week of May, because they'd still be getting frost. So it is where we are. It is what we do, and uh, here we go. As uh, we've talked about and we've been talking about, we're uh, studying the life of Noah, and as I indicated last Friday. We're going to look into this uh, phrase that Jesus uses just prior to his arrest and ultimately his crucifixion and rising again. Uh, when he talks about the, the days as it was in the days of Noah or as it was in the days of Noah. We're going to look specifically at Matthew 24. There are three questions that come out uh, from his disciples and direct result to a conversation they were having. We want to lay the groundwork, and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to get the context of what's going on. Tomorrow we'll answer question one, God willing, Wednesday question two, God willing, Thursday question three, and then Friday we'll wrap it up, all dealing primarily in this area of Matthew 24. It is pr prophetic. It is a prophetic text. Sometimes it's used to apply to the New Testament church age, and there is some error in that. Uh, this, uh, I think out of the, the two-thirds of this section that we're talking about have everything to do with the present Jewish state, where they are at the time of Jesus. And then we look to the last question, which deals more with the church age or the New Testament. So let's begin by setting the stage, okay? So we're going to begin our text. Actually, we're going to look at our text starting in Matthew 23. And just to lay the groundwork for that, remember the verse numbers and the chapter uh, coordinates, the, the chapters are not inspired by God. They were put there uh, as, an, as a resource to help people to maneuver through the scriptures and find texts much easier, okay? So our tendency is to, when we read and study the Word, we automatically stop sometimes at these chapter breaks. That doesn't mean the story stopped, nor does it mean chronologically it's another day or another hour or anything. It just means that this actually is all, sometimes it's all tied together, and that's what I want us to look at as we begin today in Matthew 23. We're going to be looking at verse number 33. Jesus is having a discussion with the Pharisees, as is, in, is very common, but he's really turned it up. And here he calls the Pharisees, in verse 33, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye, have, ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias the son of Berechias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. So in context, let's just lay out chronologically what's happening. So much of the New Testament in its writings, let's just take, for instance, let's take John chapter number 13 and on. So John 13 and those eight chapters all deal with this last week, which is the Passover week, which is the setting of the Last Supper, the crucifixion, and the rising again of Jesus Christ. 
one third, over one third of the, the Gospel of John deals just with that one week. Hence, when we look at the scriptures like Matthew and Mark, even Luke, a big chunk deals with just one week of what took place in the ministry of Jesus Christ. So when we get to Matthew 24, what has already happened is that we've already had Palm Sunday. We've already had what we call the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem when he says, Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, I would. Okay, but you persecuted the prophets and you did this and you did that. And then we also have the purging of the temple. And the purging of the temple, in this case, is probably the one that happens the second time. Many look to it as just it happening once, but I believe it happened twice. It happened at the beginning of the ministry of, of Jesus in John chapter number 2, which is at the beginning of the ministry chronologically. And then it happens again at the end in the chronological order of Jesus' ministry. Hence, he clears out the temple to bring revival and get it set right. But within three years, they're right back doing what they were always doing. They had not repented. They had not changed. Now Jesus, as rabbi, as master, is scolding the Pharisees. This is the last week before the crucifixion. Do you think they're really happy? No, they were already looking for ways to put him to death. And now they are seething. And he calls them serpents, and he calls them vipers, and he accuses them of killing the, the righteous prophets of the old. Now, don't miss this. He says, because of that, Jerusalem, the temple, is going to be destroyed. Let's read it one more time. So he says that upon you, May come, verse 35, all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of the righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Berechias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are set unto thee. How oft would I have gathered thy chick in, or children, excuse me, children together, even as a hen gather her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, for I say unto you, you shall not see henceforth till we shall you shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. It's important here that you recognize that we all recognize this wasn't just some random act. This was a this was a consequence what's about to happen by the hand of Rome at around 70 AD. What's going to happen is a direct result of thousands of years of rejecting the truth of the Bible, of the Old Testament, of the teachings of God through the prophets and the messengers. What is about to happen is the dimming of light in the temple. The light is, a, is going to go out. It is going to move from an Old Covenant, an Old Testament, to a New Covenant, New Testament. Jesus is the light of the world. And he is now going to turn, God is now turning to the Gentiles and leaving the Jews in darkness. And that is the metaphor that we will begin to read as we go down through Matthew 24. Okay, now... What I want us to also know is that this, he says, this generation, it's important that we interpret what he's about to say in Matthew 24 as we're building up to this phrase, as is in the days of Noah, that we recognize this generation. And I also want to put forth the, again, the, the tense, the, the grammar and the tense of what he's saying, what will happen, and will bring even more wrath upon their temple. Because notice how he says this phrase in a present future tense. Let's go back. He says, I send unto you prophets, wise men, scribes, and some of them ye shall kill. 
Ye shall is future. He says, I'm going to send. I send unto you prophets. So he's talking about the New Testament apostles and teachers, wise men, and they're going to go forth teaching, and they're going to still crucify them even after his resurrection. He says, you're going to do this, and you're going to scourge them in your present-day temple, t- synagogues, and you're going to persecute them city to city. Now we see the Apostle Paul, <laughs> named Saul, hired by the leadership in Jerusalem to go city to city, synagogue to synagogue, find the disciples of Christ, arrest them, persecute them, put them to death. By the time we get to about 70 AD, ironically, the Apostle Paul will have been martyred. All the disciples at this point, almost all the apostles will have been martyred at this point. And I, to be honest with you, I think the only one left is John. And that's speculative. But I think all the apostles will have been martyred by now except for John. And here we are. Jesus predicting what even after his resurrection, they are still going to be hard to the truth. Still going to turn away from it so that one generation... So if this is 33 AD, we jump forward about 40 years, less than 40 years, one generation, one generation, those that see saw his coming, those who saw his resurrection, they will still, knowing all the stories, all the truth, see the miracles, know the miracles, this generation will still reject Jesus Christ. He, it is an indication of God's long-suffering. He still, the very people that put him to death, he's still wanting to try to reach them that they might be saved. Paul would say, oh, that I would be accursed if my people would come to Christ out of Romans. What a heart. What a heart of God to want to see souls come to Christ. Now, in all of this tension, I don't want to, I want to leave it with this one thought. In all of this tension, We know this from, I won't have time to turn there, but Mark chapter number 12, just prior to Mark 13, where he begins to address this, there's this episode of the widow woman. So imagine, imagine that, you know, again, in the days previously, and he's he's purged the temple. There's a lot of tension in that temple. His disciples are probably tense. He's just had a time with the Pharisees in which he's called them out. He's called them serpents. And he's walking out of the temple and he's sitting over on the other side of the treasury and he looks across and he sees a widow woman giving her two mites. And he says to his disciples that are nearby, pay attention to her. Pay attention to her. She's giving of all her want. Could I just indicate to you there's two things I'll pull from this and we close. Number one, It's real easy to see the negative in our world today. It's easy to see negativity among those that say they're religious and point out their false doctrine and realize they're hypocrites. And we could get so disheartened. And remember, he was dealing with a mass of people that way. But even Jesus chose to see the good. Even Jesus chose to see this widow woman over across the court giving of her want. And drawing all attention to that. There's the hope. That in spite of so many that will turn their back. There's always one. That gets it. As we go forth today. Let's just keep our eyes on the ones that get it. And not get so discouraged by the ones who don't. God will take care of that. But let's be hopeful. That in the work of God. There's still the ones. That are going to go forward and get it. God bless you as you go today. Go with God. Let God go with you. It will be a blessing.